Hi everyone, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and the Perception in Action podcast and this is vlog number two. Today I wanted to show you some more of the lab equipment we use, in this case to study the effects of glare on performance. If you watched the opening week of the baseball season last week, you may have seen Bryce Harper of the Washington Nationals quite remarkable catch. If you didn't, I posted a full link to the video in the description for this. While trying to catch a line drive in the outfield, he clearly lost the ball in the sun, then had to make a blind stab at it to catch it at the last second. So what's going on here? Okay, what, are the, what do we know about what happened? So glare occurs when a light source shines into our eye, a quite bright one. I know this could be the sun, like in Harper's case, or um, it could be stadium lights, or when you're driving at night, headlights on the highway. And depending on a variety of factors, including things like the orientation of the glare source, how intense it is, it can vary from being, you know, quite just distracting and annoying, which is why people wear sunglasses or put the shades down, to quite debilitating, where it almost renders you blind. And in baseball, there's been some effort, of course, to try to avoid this in terms of the sun by building the, station, the, by building the stadiums in certain orientations. And there's actually a rule in the Major League Baseball rulebook that stadiums should be built so that the line from home plate to second base runs pretty much northeast. You can see from this figure that a lot of stadiums actually break this rule of being oriented to the northeast but they definitely do take it into account when building the stadium. So, but of course, baseball is a long, long season, so there are going to be situations where you do get the sun encroaching no matter what orientation you have this, the stadium. And that's, of course, what happened with Bryce Carper. Um, his game um, was at 2 p.m. in the afternoon um, in early April, and there's actually a, a good website that you can use, which I use for a lot of different things, to calculate the angle of the sun at certain times of day in certain locations. And this is from the website suncalc.net and it shows the orientation of the sun, which is that thick orange line, right at the time Bryce Harper had to make the catch and indeed it was pointing directly at his position in right field. So glare, the other thing that uh, affects glare a lot are um, individual differences in, in our own, in our eye. Okay, in particular if you have any imperfections, if you have any scratches or aberrant, you know, in curvature in your lens, uh, that's going to make glare even worse. Okay, and for older people, once they get if they get cataracts, which are a buildup of protein on the lens, that can make glare susceptibility really, really bad. Okay, so the uh, what happens when to to a baseball when you when you in a glare situation, what does glare do to a, a approaching baseball? Well, there's actually two parts to it. Okay, so I'll explain this, and I'll talk about how we actually study this. So, the first thing that glare does, and you know, its main, the first part of the story is that glare reduces the contrast of the image coming you're, you're viewing. Okay, so contrast is the difference in brightness between an object and its background. Right. So here I have a white baseball on a black background. I can't, that's the highest possible, 100, almost 100% contrast we can get. This is why, of course, this is what the actual background is for most hitters in most baseball stadiums, called the batter's eye. The a block of seats is blocked off in black. But if I put it on a white background now, right, it's much harder to see. Okay, I've reduced the effective contrast by a lot. Okay, so the first thing that glare does is it reduces the contrast of the, the image of the ball. Okay, so it makes it harder to see. What we found in our research is that when you reduce the contrast of a moving object, it causes your perception of its motion to change. And so it's not just that it's hard to see, you actually misperceive the direction of motion. So when a ball is approaching you, like in a line drive, there's actually two parts to the motion. Okay, there's the motion towards you, which is you, can, you detect by the expansion of the ball. So the ball is getting bigger, Okay, the rate at which its size increasing is tells you how fast it's coming. If in you know in a baseball situation, of course, due to gravity, the ball's also going to be dropping at some rate. Okay, so that's the other component. So we could separate the motion of the ball into the forward expansion part and the drop. Okay? And what we found in our research is that glare 
impairs, okay, weakens the signal from the expansion, okay? So what happens is if it's really doing that, you essentially see it like this, okay? So your, your expansion signal is weakened. Um, this part, the dropping part, is unaffected, okay? And there's lots of other research showing that there's fundamental differences between the, what we call the motion and depth system and the frontal plane motion system. And so what happens here is this part's weakened, causing, this causes two effects, okay? It causes the ball to, you perceive it to be coming at you much more slowly than it really is. And you also perceive it to be dropping more, right? Because this signal is stronger than that one, okay? So the ball is slower and, dro and dropping more than it really is. So you can see what happened to Harper, right? So when the ball gets close, right, and you get other cues, visual cues to tell you that you're making an error in your perception, what will happen is as it gets close, you'll realize, wow, it's coming way faster than I thought, and it's coming higher towards my face more than I thought. Okay, so your natural response is exactly what Harper did, right, to, to do this, right? So how do we study glare in the lab, right? How do we, we study this, and how can we detect, tell who's the mo uh, people that are going to be the most susceptible to glare? This has been a really interesting thing for me over the years, and I've studied this for quite a while, and glare susceptibility is the, the visual attribute that I have found has the single highest intersubject variability. That means it differs more than anything between people than anything I've ever seen. You get some people that are unaffected by it at all. They can basically drive right into a sunset. And then you get people, uh, which I'm closer to, um, which that really, really blinds them. They almost have to pull over and stop. And what we found is that who is susceptible to glare or not does not depend on other visual abilities. So people with great acuity, people who can see really fine details, may still be susceptible to glare. So to study glare, we use really two things. We use uh, what are called low contrast eye charts. So if I pull this up here, this was something developed by my, form, my PhD supervisor, Martin Regan. This, uh, so a regular eye chart used at a doctor's office is high contrast, black on white. These are different shades of gray on white, okay, which make it harder to see. And it's these lower contrast objects that are going to be more affected by glare. So what we do is we have people read a low contrast eye chart, just like you would at the doctor's office, see how well you can do it. Then we use this device. Okay? This is another thing that Martin invented called the Brightness Acuity Tester, or BAT. Okay? Um, I like to call it the ice cream scoop, right? because it really does look like an ice cream scoop. So what this is, is that it's a hemisphere with a little hole in it. So in the kind of the baseline condition, you put it up to your eye and I, I can see you through the hole. I can read, I could read the eye chart. Then we have up here, you're not going to be able to see this because of the camera's going to adjust it out. There's a little light up here in, the, in here that I can turn on at different levels. Okay. And then have you read it. And now we have a, a light source shining in my eye while I'm trying to read. Okay. So we've produced glare. And what we find is most people's acuity, their, you know, the long, how far down the chart they can read, uh, gets worse, okay? And we've done a variety of studies where we use this to try to predict their effect on performance, okay? So we've done some driving studies uh, where, uh, where we've used that, then look at people's uh, ability to make left turns in front of oncoming traffic. And then we've done a baseball study, actually. Uh, both of these are published. I'll put uh, links to them. Um, where we had people trying to catch line drives, baseball players to catch line drives from a pitching machine where I had a big spotlight pointing in their face, okay, and we did get the kind of predicted effect of performance. But the most uh, interesting thing is that what we found is we can predict who is going to have problems with catching and driving from this simple test, right? There was a strong correlation between the score on this test and how it actually affected the number of balls they caught, for example. And more recently, what we started to do is look at the effect of things like using eye black, which is black under the eye, which you see a lot of athletes do in wearing sunglasses, whether that actually improves the situation. Okay, so that's some of the effects of glare, um, and that's how we study it in the lab. Before I finish today, I just wanted to mention the uh, upcoming episode of the Perception and Action podcast uh, next Tuesday. 
I'm going to be looking at some articles, um, reviewing some recent articles, a couple of really interesting topics. One that a lot of people are interested in is this idea of movement variability, right? So when we're training a skill, do we want movement variability? So when we're training you to pitch, do we want you to produce the exact same motion, um, you know, learn to produce the exact same motion so that your, your movement is complete, has really low variability? Or when you're learning a skill, is it actually beneficial to have some high variability? And what we'll see is we're going to distinguish between variability that has a direct effect on performance, right? So that might be your angle of your, arm, your hand right as you release it, like your release point, right? So as a pitcher, we, probably, we want the release point to be pretty consistent, okay? But the other type of variability, which you, know, is, you could call execution variability, is how we get our arm to that release point, right? And that can vary, right? And that allows us to use different styles and techniques, which may be a better fit for certain athletes. Okay, so that's one thing I'm gonna talk about. The other thing I'm going to talk about is uh, explicit versus implicit knowledge, right? So when we perform a task, we can learn a task and be able to verbally explain, you know, be consciously verbal expl explanation of what we're doing, what we learned. That's called explicit knowledge. Or for some things, we can just do it without being able to tell you how we do it. That's implicit knowledge. There's a, there's a really interesting study looking at the difference between acquired versus given explicit knowledge, right? So when you build up the, you build up these rules and understand these facts on your own, is there any difference from that between the, when your coach tells you them right from the start of practice? And you'll see that there is an interesting difference.